Good evening, welcome, and thank you for joining us for tonight's program, The Takeaway Men, with author Dr. Meryl Ain. I'm Carrie Altman, Director of Outreach and Community Programming at the Nathan and Esther Peltz Holocaust Education Resource Center, otherwise known as HERC, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. HERC is dedicated to the building of a society resting on the values of tolerance and diversity dignity and respect toward all human beings. Herc teaches these lessons to students, educators, and community members every day throughout the state of Wisconsin and beyond. Thank you to our co-sponsor of this event, Boswell Book Company, and thank you to all of you watching for your continued support of Herc's mission. Our special guest this evening is writer, career educator and award-winning author, Dr. Meryl Ain. Her articles and essays have appeared in the Huffington Post, The Forward, The New York Jewish Week, The New York Times, Newsday, and other publications. The Takeaway Men, her debut novel, was published in August of this year. It is the result of her lifelong quest to learn more about the Holocaust a thirst that was triggered by reading the diary of Anne Frank in the sixth grade. The Takeaway Men was recently named winner by both the American Fiction Awards and the Best Book Awards in the category of historical fiction. It is also a finalist in the Canadian Book Club Awards. Dr. Ain lives on Long Island with her husband, Stuart, a journalist. They have three married sons and six grandchildren. We are also grateful to this evening's moderator, Dr. Rachel Baum, a HERC board member and deputy director of the Sam and Helen Stahl Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Immediately following the interview, there will be a live virtual Q&A moderated by Dr. Baum. Please post your questions in the comments section on Facebook any time throughout the presentation. And now it is an honor and a privilege to introduce Dr. Meryl Ain and Dr. Rachel Baum. Thank you so much, Carrie. And thank you so much, Meryl, if I might use your first name for joining us. I have been looking forward to this ever since I read your book. Uh, which we hope everyone will buy at Boswell Books. Um, and it's such an interesting book because it doesn't focus on the time of the Holocaust, which is what we've come to expect. It's really a post-Holocaust novel, right? That picks up after the Holocaust as this couple makes their way from a displaced persons camp and makes their way to the United States with their family and, um, and has a life. So I'm wondering, what was it about that time period that called to you rather than writing a book that focused on the Holocaust? Okay, well, well, thank you very much, Rachel. I'm very happy to be here with you. And I want to thank Carrie also for that beautiful introduction. So um, at, as she mentioned in the introduction, I have been very, very interested in the Holocaust for a long time, ever since I read the diary of Anne Frank when I was in the sixth grade. And um, I wanted to know what happened to Anne Frank when the book ended. And of course, we, you know, it, so it took a very long time to find out. I actually recently saw a documentary about what happened uh, to Anne, but the, but the diary d does not tell us what happened. Uh, there are many, many Holocaust novels. In fact, I did a little research and I found that it is, I think, the number one best-selling category on Amazon. Um, they're, they're very, very popular. So I didn't want to write another Holocaust novel, but because I've been so interested in the topic, I was a history teacher. I have been researching this for many, many years. I read everything I can. I watch everything. I can, I 
and I have friends, I've, I have had, we have had close family friends who are Holocaust survivors. And I should say right now that I, surprisingly, am not, am not a child of Holocaust survivors. Um, both my parents were born here and actually they both served in World War II. Uh, they were both in, both in the army. Um, I also have many close friends who are children of Holocaust survivors. And it just occurred to me um, that this was an important story to tell. Uh, there are some novels that take place uh, after uh, the Holocaust, but not nearly as many as Holocaust novels. And it seemed to me that it was a very important story to tell. You know, what happened to the survivors and their children once the war was over? You know, in popular culture, uh, six million Jews were murdered, five million others. Um, the survivors went, um, you know, very few of them stayed in Europe. So they went to the United States or Canada or Australia or Palestine and then Israel. Um, and, and that was the end of the story. But that wasn't the end of the story. That was not nearly the end of the story because the cloud of the Holocaust not only followed uh, the survivors, but impacted their children in ways that we are still learning, even if the parents never talked about the Holocaust. So, so I thought it was an important subject. Absolutely. And I, one of the things I really appreciate about your book is that often when we do have Holocaust survivors in novels, um, or when we hear about Holocaust survivors in popular culture, sometimes we only see their lives through that lens. And I think that you've created rich characters who have personalities that, you know, that all survivors weren't the same. They didn't have the same response to their experiences. You know, you mentioned that you are not a child of survivors. I'm wondering, given how much people talk about who can write about the Holocaust and um, who has authority to do that, were you nervous about writing this book or did it take you some time to come to that decision? Well, it's it's a great question. Um, I didn't know enough to be nervous about it when I first started. I, I researched the book for about two years, and then in the third year, I started writing and continued researching it. Um, I was a little um, nervous about it, and I, I did show it um, to my friends who were, who were second generation. Um, but what got me really nervous uh, was the whole brouhaha about uh, Janine Cummins' American Dirt. Um, you know, the, the question of, you know, do, do, you, do you have the right um, to speak uh, for a group if you're not part of the group? And, you know, I thought about it. I, I actually read American Dirt and I, I enjoyed it very much. Um, I, my answer to that is, um, if you do your research, and 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 I really feel that I my research was done meticulously, um, and, and and you check with with, well, you know, you can't check with someone if you're writing a historical novel about the Middle Ages. You know, it's it's only based on on. Uh, on the research, but you know, I, I did have readers. And one of the things I was much most gratified by was um, a couple of my friends who were second generation said to me, you know, you got it right because you did not paint us with one brush stroke. You, you showed um, the two extremes. So the one twin, Jojo, just wanted to be an American girl. She was embarrassed by her father's accent. The, the other sister, Branca, was just just felt it. She felt it. She felt it in her guts and was very sensitive and really wanted to heal her father on some level. And then there are all shades in between. So, you know, I think if 
you can only write about what you yourself have experienced. We wouldn't have a lot of the world's great books, but I absolutely think that you have to be meticulous about your research. And I, I'm not gonna mention the names of any Holocaust novels, but there are some um, that just don't ring true. And I think that that is, a, that is a travesty because when we're writing about the Holocaust or after the Holocaust, we, we have a responsibility um, to tell the truth. So, and I, I also think the characters um, have to be plausible. Uh, so I, you know, I, I hope I did that. And um, I, I, you know, but I, but I did, I did think about it. I thought about it more after that whole, uh, you know, controversy over uh, Janine Cummins' book. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that issue of trauma and how it gets passed down. Because another thing I really appreciated about your book is that, on the one hand, we have this intergenerational trauma from the Holocaust, and you see how that affects the family. But you see other families that are not play that do not have a Holocaust connection, but they also have their secrets, have their betrayals, have complexity. So in a way, when I got to the end of the book, I thought, you know, this family is different because it's a survivor family, and they're also not different because all of the families have something. So I'm wondering, to what extent do you see this as a universal? Like, to what extent? Does this book have universal appeal or can different people connect to it? And to what extent do you think it really is about survivors? If that question makes, well, makes sense I, to you. I think that's a good question. I haven't been asked that question before. Um, I, you know, when I, when I wrote the book, I said, okay, this is, you know, I'm Jewish. This is a Jewish book. And I'm good. It's going to be. It's going to be very Jewish. I mean, I personally had to look up a lot of the Yiddish words because I don't speak Yiddish. But I said, I'm. Not, you know, I, I'm just going to make this uh, Jewish, and if Jews read it, that's great. Um, but much to my pleasant surprise, it's really resonating um, with people who are not Jewish as well and i think that's because it is a family saga and it we and i think that that as you so, said so well that that secrets and lies and uh intergenerational conflict and questions of identity uh are present in in every family and and every every era so, um, yeah. Yeah, and you have said in, you know, previously that um, the Holocaust affects the next generation whether or not the parents talk about it. But in your book, it's really the fact that they don't talk about it that becomes the problem, right? And in your research, did you find that, that that's common for families with survivors or that? Well, I I found, you know, what I what I portrayed in the book. Uh, so I had Aaron, who absolutely refused to talk about it, and then his foil was Jacob Zilberman, who who could not stop talking about it. And um, you know, there's a very um, excellent book um, that that I used um, for one of the books I used for my research by. Um, Menachem Rosensaft. Um, it's called. Um, what's it called now? Uh, um, from the ashes, from the ashes, and it's about identity and and faith and how children of survivors um, view that and 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 how they're alike and how they're different and and each it's it's a collection of essays by by children of survivors. Um, so I think that there is, um, there was a wide range. Um, some talked about it, some couldn't stop talking about it and some never mentioned it. In fact, I did a program in August um, with a woman named Helen Epstein, not Helen Epstein, Helen Fremont. Helen Epstein has written a lot about 
children of survivors also, and I, and I used her work as research as well. But Helen Fremont has written um, two memoirs and she basically um, is the daughter of two Jewish Holocaust survivors, but she didn't find that out until she was 35 years old. She was raised as a Catholic. She and her sister were raised as Catholics because her parents had taken on um, a Catholic identity to, to save themselves during the war. And then they just kept it. And even when they came to this country, they felt that it was just too dangerous to be Jewish um, in the world. So I think there, there's just a big, you know, there, there's a big range. The other thing that I, I really would like to mention is that I don't think that um, the society of um, post-war America was, was not that I don't think, I, I know, it was not interested in, in talking about it. We didn't have the word Holocaust at that time. Um, the Americans, um, you know, soldiers were returning from the war. They were getting married. They were going back to school with the GI Bill of Rights. They were starting families. There were new businesses booming. It looked like it was a very happy time. And I don't think that people were focusing in general. I mean, obviously some people were, were not focusing on these people they thought of as refugees and not survivors. And then of course, during that time, there was also that very disturbing underbelly with the, you know, with the red scare and the, the nuclear scare. So I don't think that Americans were focused on it. And um, the fact was that the, the US government invited um, at least a thousand, probably more um, former Nazis to this country um, to work uh, in the space program, to work in the nuclear program, and even more to um, track down communists, Russians. So um, it just wasn't something um, that was focused on. And I, I think, you know, that many survivors just were interested in coming and starting a new life. But certainly there were, there were those who spoke about it. You mentioned uh, the Red Scare. So I wasn't sure I was going to ask you about this, but since you opened the door, I hope you won't mind my asking. You mentioned the Rosenbergs in the book. And um, what was it about the Rosenbergs that that called to you, that, that you've worked that into the story in that way? Again, I don't want to give any well, I have spoilers. Been... Okay, I, I won't. I, I, I've been interested in the Rosenbergs um, almost as long, I would say probably starting in college uh, when I found out about it. I, I didn't know about uh, the story before. And um, so the whole, the whole concept of the takeaway men, uh, I, I co-authored um, a nonfiction book in 2014, The Living Memories Project, Legacies That Last. And we interviewed um, 32 individuals about how they um, keep the memories of their loved ones alive. And one of the people we interviewed, because I wanted to, you know, I, I've been interested in the Rosenbergs, was Robert Mirapol, who is the younger son of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. And what we found out from that interview was um, that that trauma of losing his parents when he was six years old stayed with him his whole life. And um, I, I thought that there was definitely um, a connection with, with the with this story. And you know, the, that really raises the question of children. And I wanted to ask you why you decided to focus your book, you know, in the title, The Takeaway Men, it's really about through the, a child's eyes and why you decided to focus on children rather than the parents. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I thought that um, it would be a, a more poignant story through the eyes of the children. Um, I, I should say that I had my own 
takeaway men experience um, when I was a young child, um, someone came to the door and as a joke, I didn't know who he was. And I said, who are you? And he said, I'm the takeaway man. I've come to take you away. And I, I believed him and I still remember um, the terror uh, that I felt. And um, I also, you know, during the time I was writing the book, um, one of the, you know, big news stories was separating children from their parents on the southern border. And I, I so I had, you know, I had just a visceral uh, feeling of that, that trauma that, and I thought it could uh, best be conveyed uh, through the eyes of the children. And the reason, I, which I think I touched on before, why I use the vehicle of the twins was because even though they um, had the exact same environment, they were in the same womb, they had the same parents, they had the same experiences, they reacted uh, very, very differently. Thank you for that. Um, a member of our audience, our, our Facebook audience has asked you, has asked what inspired you to write the book. I think you've touched on a number of things, but if there's anything else about inspiration that you haven't said yet, I want to invite you to share. Okay, I, you know, I wanted to, I, all of my work prior to this had been nonfiction. So, you know, the nonfiction books, and then I, I had worked um, as a journalist and I still, um, I had an opinion piece in the forward a few weeks ago. I, everything I published, let's say, <laughs> everything I've published, almost everything um, has been nonfiction. So um, I thought that this story lended itself to fiction. And one of the reasons um, I was inspired to write it is because I wanted to raise questions rather than answer them. When, when I write an opinion piece, I'm giving my opinion, you know, and I didn't really want to give my opinion. I wanted to raise issues and raise themes um, that the reader would have to think about. So um, one of the questions is a question of uh, religious identity. Um, in this case, you know, who is a Jew or even, you know, who, who, is, who is a Catholic and, and is it a bloodline? Is it a choice? Can you be two things? You know, there are some Jews and Buddhists. Uh, can you be Jewish and Catholic at the same time? I know when I was growing up, you know, I had friends who said, um, I'm half and half. So that, that was, I thought that was, that was an interesting question, the question of religious identity. But more than that, um, I wanted to uh, raise the issue of um, wh what is our responsibility to people, to others? You know, how do we treat people who are different uh, in, in particular? How do, how do we treat immigrants? How do we, uh, what do we do when we see evil in the world? You know, do we look the other way? Do we stand and watch? Do we speak out? Do we take action? Um, also, you know, what's, what's the impact of secrets and lies on adults and children alike? So these were uh, themes and questions and um, I, that, that was really, um, part of my inspiration besides, as I said before, really wanting to tell this story, that the story didn't end with the war, that the story goes on. That's so interesting and helpful. You as an educator yourself know that some people find Holocaust, the idea of Holocaust fiction really controversial. Um, and I really appreciate the role of the arts and fiction, and obviously you do too. And I'm wondering, what is it? Is there something that you think art can do, or fiction can do, literature can do, that straight history can't do? Or what does art and literature add to history? Why? Well, why a I, Holocaust novel? Well, again, I wrote a post Holocaust novel, but why a Holocaust yeah. novel? Because if you do the research 
correctly and you do it meticulously and you you're you're doing it from the perspective of a human of, of how this really affected human beings i mean i'm look i'm i'm a history person i love doing research i can't do enough so you know i i, I i've always read a tremendous amount of nonfiction. But that's not for everybody. Everybody doesn't like that. And there are people who are avid, um, avid novel readers and they read and read and read. And I think that the story, um, so remembering the Holocaust is very, very important. And as um, Holocaust survivors are aging and, and, and dying, and at some point there won't be any to tell the story, it, you know, it becomes incumbent on their children. But I also think on storytellers, on the arts, uh, to to tell that story and to and to bring people in in an emotional way. I mean, you're not necessarily being emotionally uh, drawn in when you when you read um, a nonfiction book. So I, for example, um, and I'm not going to give anything away but you know i i write about um the kels pogrom which um was just a travesty and and jews were murdered um in cold blood in poland uh a year after the war was over in europe and um when i first found out about it i i was shocked because i had never heard about it and I we were in the Berkshires and we went to a Jewish film festival and we saw this this documentary where a a, a native a young man from Kels made a documentary and he went and he interviewed current residents and asked if they knew about it or what they thought about it um so it's it's it, it's horrible. I mean, the facts are horrible on their own. But when you, you know, put that in a story and you show how that really impacted human beings, I think it makes it all the more powerful. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there's just a way in which your book really brings the the issues, you know, gives it real form and brings them to life for the reader. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I just want to, there's a few things that I was so interested in about your book, and I hope you won't mind my asking them. Um, I thought it was really interesting that you focused on some interfaith families, because again, there's just a number of things about your book that, you know, again, I'm not an expert um, exactly in, you know, I haven't read all of the post-Holocaust novels, but that I haven't seen before. And one of those things is your emphasis on interfaith families. Why was that important to you? Why why were you, was that theme important to you? Well, I think um, I think it's an important question. I think it's an important question. Um, it's been on the radar screen of the of the Jewish community here for about um, thirty years. Um, you know, there's a, a, a great great deal of uh, intermarriage. And I think again, that the question, you know, how do we welcome people who are different? How do, how do we treat people who are different? Um, I, think it's, I think it's an important question. And I think um, I, I wanted people um, to think about that. And I think um, hopefully, you know, we treat everybody with respect and we, honor all religions. And um, I, I just wanted to throw that out there. I, I really appreciate the way that you you layer that in your book, that there's a multiple ways in which this is a book about, as you say, welcoming people and, and coming to know people who are different. Um, you mentioned before, you know, that Jacob says, oh, it's the age old question, you know, who is a Jew? Um, and I, again, I think that there's a real, um, you have a, a real empathy for your characters that you see in this book that there's lots of different ways of being a Jew and even being a good Jew, right? There's just a kindness that you seem to really 
care about your characters. When you were writing, did they come to life for you? Did you feel like you were spending time with them? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because I, as I mentioned, I really spent two years researching it and I would start writing and then trash what I wrote and then I'd write something else and say, nah, nah, nah. And, and then when I got to the third year, I just, I got into flow and I really, I know authors say this and I, I felt like they were leading me. They were really telling me um, what to do and what to write. When I finished the book, I thought, again, I'm, no spoilers for our audience, but I thought this is a book about hope, right? That, that the book ends and I felt this feeling of hope that you know we had been on a journey together. And as I was reflecting on your writing it, I was thinking you were writing this, what I see as a hopeful book at a time when a lot of people were not necessarily feeling hope, you know, that, that there's been, you know, people have been struggling in a variety of ways. Were you thinking about hope or trying to, to give something to the reader I, when you were I, writing? I, I actually, you're very astute. Um, I actually was, and uh, besides hope, I was writing about, uh, about resilience. Mm -hmm. And um, there's one passage at, at the be right at the beginning, so I don't think I'm giving anything away. Um, when when the neighbor is arrested in conjunction, uh, you know, with the, with the Rosenberg trial, and Aaron, the Holocaust survivor, has only been in this country a few days, and he he sees this happening, and he's horrified, and it brings him back to Poland, you know, when the, she's a young woman, the same age as his wife. And he's, he says, you know, wh wh why, why are they taking her away? And he, he speaks to his rabbi and I have the rabbi saying, you know, that, that the, the country is, 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 is grounded in the constitution and there are um, nasty political, uh, times uh, from, you know, from time to time, but this will pass. So yeah, <laughs> I was definitely thinking about the current, but I think that that that's timeless as well. Absolutely. And I definitely had the sense that this book is really, you know, again, if I may, it reads as, as a kind of a love letter to our country, right? They have this sense and, you know, you dedicate it to your grandparents and to your parents and, you know, with great affection for their love of the American dream and of this country. And that really comes through this sense of our shared ideals. Yeah. Um, and I've I, got some, you know, oh, it, sorry. It, it, it is, it, I mean, it, it certainly has a lot of flaws, but it's really, um, it's the best place in the world. And it's, you know, we have to work on improving it constantly. So I have some more questions from our community. Um, one person asked, did you share your idea about writing this book with your children and did they help you with the research? Whew. Well, okay, I, um, my husband was my muse and my husband, um, I, as, as I uh, wrote each chapter, I, um, I showed it to my husband and, and he weighed in. Um, I did, I did talk a bit to my, my children about it. Um, I did. And, and also my, my daughters-in-law and, um, they made suggestions and we, we bounced ideas off. Um, I, you know, in terms of the secret, uh, Judy's secret. I until I finally came up with that whole story, which I'm not going to tell you now. We that that was months and months and months, um, if not years. And and one of my daughters-in-law was was particularly um, helpful with that. Yeah. Another person asked, "Did you um, did?" It says, "Did Merrill talk about interviewing Holocaust survivors?" Did I guess the question is, did you interview Holocaust survivors specifically for in your research? Or can you talk a little bit about what kind of research you did more specifically? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that I interviewed Holocaust survivors specifically for, 
the book, but I have over the years um, interviewed Holocaust survivors for different stories and different articles. And um, when I was working as an administrator in a large uh, public school district, um, we had uh, different programs and um, we brought in at one point a Holocaust survivor and a survivor of the Rwandan genocide um, who spoke to the students. And I, um, as I, I, and I, as I said, I was talking to my second generation friends. I read a tremendous amount. I read um, books, documents, uh, primary sources, um, diaries, um, you name it. Um, I watched documentaries um, and and anything I could really get my hands on. And I, and I'm and I'm still I'm I'm still reading it. So for instance, uh, you mentioned at the beginning, um, the um, the twins were born in a in a DP camp. So I had a whole whole um, foray into <laughs> researching uh, de displaced persons camps, and you know where were they and. Uh, what did they look like and uh, what services did they offer? And, and I, I found out that, you know, there were very few children who survived the Holocaust, but there was a real baby boom in the DP camps. And um, then I had to decide um, which camp should I have my uh, characters in? And I just couldn't make a decision. So I decided to fictionalize it. And I gave it the name Wartplatz, which means waiting place in German. So it was sort of a composite uh, of different DP camps. Was there anything that you thought, because this is, as you mentioned, has been a lifelong interest for you. Was there anything that surprised you in your research that you thought that you knew something and then you read something that made you rethink what you had known? Well, as I mentioned, um, the Kels pogrom came as mm -hmm. a huge shock to me. And also um, the fact that um, there was just no taste for going after Nazis uh, after, after the war. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, you, you talked about fiction and I, I think it's okay for me to bring this up. It's not a book, but um, the, that Netflix series, The Hunters. I don't know if you saw it, but mm -hmm. I just felt that that was just historically inaccurate and and really presented um, people as stereotypes, and um, it it just it just wasn't it wasn't the case, you know. So um, I was very very careful to um, adhere to to what actually took place. So I always like to ask writers about their, their writing habits. I'm wondering, did you find, you know, you've been a writer for a long time. Did you keep up the same sorts of writing habits or did you find that it was different being a novelist? What does your writing day look like? It's different for me. It's very different for me um, because when I, I was, well, when I was out covering stories, I would cover the story and, and I would write it. And I also, when my children were very young, um, I was doing this um, and I would work between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. in the morning, which I don't, I don't do that anymore. Um, what I do, I find that I'm freshest early in the morning and I, I try to write at least five days a week. So um, I get up at 6 a.m. every day, but sometimes I won't get started writing until eight or nine, but it has to be in the morning. I don't know, for some reason, once in a while, if I'm really on a roll, I can go into the afternoon, but I can't start in the afternoon for some reason. So um, I write and I write on a laptop and I write wherever I am. I don't <laughs> write at a desk. <laughs> And um, that those are my writing habits. <laughs> so I have to ask what you're working on now. And given that the Takeaway Men features two children, is there, might there be a sequel in the works? I 
Uh oh, did I lose you? Yeah. Uh, um, so it's interesting. So um, as I as I mentioned before, I am um, as I as I finished each chapter, I I shared it with my husband, and he was more than happy um, to weigh in and to make suggestions and say you need more action here. You need a former Nazi. Um, and when we got to the end, um, well, I didn't think it was the end. When I got to the chapter, which became the end, he said to me, that's the end. And I said, no, it isn't. Because I intended to go at least 10 years out because I thought, mm -hmm. I, you know, it ends in 1962. And I really wanted to go into the late 60s, early 70s, because there's so much ferment in, in American society at that time. I had no intention of ending there. And he said, no, that it's that's the end. And, you know, I considered it. I thought about it. And um, I decided he was right. And truthfully, I was more than happy to be finished with it. Um, so it, um, what has happened now, I've gotten a lot, I'm, I'm just so thrilled. A lot of people have said they're really invested in the characters, they wanna know what happened to them and they suggested that I write a sequel. So I, you know, I'm thinking about it, I'm doing, I'm doing a tremendous number of Zooms. I challenged myself, um, the book was published in August, I challenged myself to do a um, hundred virtual programs from August to August. And believe it or not, I've already either done or scheduled um, 38. So uh, yeah, so I'm very, you know, I'm very um, busy with that. So I really didn't start, but um, there's something called NaNoWriMo. Did you ever hear of that National Novel mm -hmm. Writing Month? And um, you you challenge yourself, well, you're supposed to challenge yourself to write 50,000 words in a month, which was not happening with me. But um, one of my friends who's also an author said, why don't we do it together and support each other? So I did um, begin in November. I've written 12,000 words and it'll, it's going to take a while, but I'm, I'm really excited about it because I'm going to bring them, you know, through the tumultuous sixties and they're going to grow up and, um, should be interesting. Yeah. I look forward to it. Thank you. We have Thank another you. question from our community. Can you talk about the storyline of the religious school teacher who was discouraged from sharing the truth? I found it fascinating. Um, that, yeah, that was probably the one thing in the book, um, other than the former Nazi, um, that was really um, very fictionalized, but, but I wanted to um, raise the issue. So I, I did that as a device um, to raise the issue. And uh, the story is about um, a Hebrew school teacher and and the kids ask her um, about Hitler and the final solution because some of their parents have not told them and 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 they want to know and the teacher is actually a survivor and she answers very honestly and then she gets called into the principal's office and and really uh, balled out and and the principal's um thinking is that this is not in the curriculum it's not our place to tell the children it's up to the parents and and she was um you know she was just completely uh wrong in bringing this up now did this ever happen i don't know that it ever happened i mean this 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 was fictionalized, but what is, is true is that at that time, this was not being taught. Uh, the Holocaust was not being, there was no word Holocaust. I don't think the word Holocaust um, was coined until the late 70s. So in the late 50s, um, there was no word Holocaust. Um, it was not talked about. Um, survivors were looked at 
as refugees and you know individual uh, survivors might have talked to their children about it but it wasn't on anybody's curriculum so so that was the explanation for that scene um, I actually had actually I had actually wanted to ask you about yourself as an educator. Is it your you spent your whole life as an educator? Is it your hope that this book is taught in schools? Would you like to see that? Would love to see that. I would absolutely love to see that. And what? Sorry, I'm going to just do a little uh, as a fellow teacher. Like what? grade would you see it in or where would you like to see it? Have you given thought to how you would want it to be I, I hadn't really thought about it. You know, when I was writing it, I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe this could be, but I, but I wasn't sure. And then I, I just wasn't thinking about it because when I was writing it, I was thinking of it as a book club book. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I was thinking of it. At. And, and then I have um, friends who taught high school or who teach high school um, who thought that it would be good. And I've also had a number of um, librarians reach out to me to do programs and, and they suggested um, definitely, you know, definitely high school. Um, I don't, I don't know about middle school. I mean that, you know, because there's, not there's not explicit sex but there's um references but people say to me oh come on kids today i i don't know you know i i don't know but uh, but definitely high school uh yeah I, I would i would love to see that yeah it seems like it would be um again because it brings up so many interesting issues through the storylines that it could be a really rich um, book for a classroom. So we'll put that plug in there. Thank you. So I want to invite if anyone else has any questions that they would like to ask Dr. Ain. This is your chance. If not, let me make sure that I will be able to sleep and I don't have any lingering questions that are going to keep me up tonight. <laughs> This was really such a pleasure. I really Thank enjoyed you. meeting you so much and enjoyed your book and enjoyed talking with you about your book. And I really hope that I know some of the people here tonight have read your book. I hope that people who haven't read the book are now have their curiosity peaked and head over to that link at Boswell Books and go and purchase your book. And uh, they can stop me in the street or find me on Zoom to talk to me about it because I'd love to. So my thanks and our thanks, first of all, and most importantly to you, Dr. Ain, for sharing so freely of yourself and your time with us tonight. And of course, to Herc and to the, everyone here watching on Facebook and to our great partner, Boswell Books. Thank you so much. Thank, have a good thank night. you. It, it's really been a pleasure. And I have to say, I've, I've had many interviews. You really asked a very uh, interesting and, and, and penetrating questions. I, I well, really we hope enjoyed it went, your question. <laughs> we hope it went well enough that when you, you're, you write your next book, you will come back and see I, us. <laughs> I, I, I would love to. And let me tell people if they want to um, go to my website, um, it's, it's merylane.com. And there, there's more information about the book and there, there are uh, questions for book clubs and, and other information. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Good night, you. all. Night.